Welcome to Redbeard and the Den of Tools. Howdy ho guys and gals, it's Red, your friendly neighborhood tool bear. Back again to talk to you about some exciting news from Lincoln of all people. Apparently they didn't get the memo that the sedan is dead. But uh, they've got some exciting things going on over there with the new Lincoln Continental that they released last year. But before we dive into that, I thought it'd be a good time to talk about all the trials and tribulations that the uh, the old Continental has gone through. So we're here to do a brief history of the Lincoln Continental. Yeah, uh, going all the way back to 1939 when Edsel Ford decided that he wanted a vacation car. <laughs> don't, don't we all, right? Yeah, well, you know, that's, that's my vacation car. Anyway, he commissioned a coach-built Lincoln Zephyr convertible. Knowing that potential buyers would look at what the president of the company drove, he decided to use this car as a showpiece. And in an effort to appeal to the more, uh, shall we say, affluential market, he specifically asked that the car have a European continental design to it. And thus the name and style of the Continental. <laughs> Sorry, I get a chuckle every time I say the Continental. I always reminds me of this. Forgive me if my hungry eyes feast on the banquet of your sumptuous decolletage. All right. Anyway, the Continental launched a whole new segment of the car industry, and that was of the, the personal car luxury segment. That is something that somebody who had money might drive themselves rather than be driven around in. Uh, Ford chief stylist Eugene Gregory uh, was uh, tasked for this uh, this special project, and he used the blueprints off of the old uh, Lincoln Zephyr as the base. Edsel was trying to bring back the look and feel of the old 29 uh, Lincoln Victoria, uh, but add a modern flair to it. Personally, I'm more of a 34 bear myself, if you know what I mean. Oh, now that's pretty. The prototype was fitted with a 267 cubic inch V12. Oh yeah. Front and rear leaf springs with, ooh, hydraulic drum brakes. Yeah, that was a big thing for the time. Uh, the biggest style change away from the Zephyr was that the whole car was actually sat seven inches shorter. This put the hood in line with the fenders for the first time. This became an issue then for the spare tire. So as a nod to that European styling they were going after, they decided to move the spare tire to behind the trunk. Now, this was a controversial uh, decision at the time, as most American cars were doing away entirely with an external mounted spare tire. Uh, it was kind of a, they were retro chic before it was chic to be retro. He's <laughs> such a hipster. 1939 to 1948 became the first official generation of the old Continental. There were few changes from the original prototype, other than the grill was changed a bit and the fenders were squared up some. Apparently the swoopiness of the fenders was considered to be a little too continental and uh, squaring these up was a design compromise to bring the car back in lines with more traditional American styling uh, temperament of the time, if you will. Anyway, just after the, uh, the continental took off, unfortunately it had to go on hiatus as that was the attack on Pearl Harbor, and the car was put in uh, suspended production status. At least for the public. Apparently the government could still get their hands on it because, I mean, you want to see your general driving around in like a New Yorker or anything. Anyway, with the end of World War II, production picked back up. Uh, but 1948 turned out to be the last year for the original Continental. There was a move in the market away from personal luxury vehicles, and the Continental was retired. Sadly, this also marked the last time in the U.S. that an American factory produced a V12 engine in a, I should say, in a production vehicle. In 1956, the Continental, a.k.a. Mark II, comes back. At its launch, the Mark II was the most expensive vehicle sold in the U.S. by an American manufacturer, coming in at a staggering ten thousand dollars put this in perspective it cost as much as a rolls royce silver cloud there was only one option available at the time uh for six hundred dollars you could get ac with that car anyway despite its hefty price tag ford was still losing about a thousand dollars per car due to the fact that these cars were mostly handmade uh between 1956 and 57 they sold nearly three thousand continentals Yep, do your math, that adds up to $3 million in loss. 
To put that in perspective with today's dollars, that's about $28 million. That's a hefty price tag to lose just for the exclusivity of selling a car at the same price tag as a Rolls Royce. Well, the third generation Continental landed in 1958 and Ford put Lincoln on a budget. They told them that the car had to be sold for no more than $6,000 and that it had to at least break even. Well, I don't know about the break even part, but up until this point, the Continental division had been running kind of as its own company, uh, or I should say at least as a subsidiary under Lincoln itself, who in turn was a subsidiary to Ford. Well, with Papa Ford cutting up his credit cards, Lincoln had a uh, come-to-Jesus conversation with the folks over in their Continental division, and they decided to close them down. That ended the era of the hand-built Lincoln Continental, and that moved production onto the assembly line. Now being built alongside other Lincolns, they had to find a way to make this Continental stand out from the crowd. The major style point that would mark the um, uh, Mark III... <laughs> was the reverse slant roofline. This allowed for a retractable breezeway window in the back to help augment climate control for those in the rear seats. Spiffy, eh? Yeah, I couldn't have that on the back seat with my cubs. They'd wear out that motor in no time. 1961 saw the launch of the fourth gen uh, Continental. The Continental symbol. Hallmark of a new concept in fine cars. Lincoln Continental for 1961. Lincoln Continental. Classic beauty in a smart new size. Despite bringing the Continental in-house, Lincoln still had lost $60 million over the previous three years. To save money, uh, they were forced to streamline down to one single model, a four-door. Now, true, they did have it available as a convertible or a hardtop, this model did bring back the classic suicide doors, though, not seen since 1951. The entire car was trimmed down, though, by 15 inches overall and 8 inches at the wheelbase. Dubbed the Mark V by this point, it was still heavier than all its rivals, including Cadillac. The new design for the Continental came from all places, the Ford Thunderbird. Ford VP of design, Elwood Engel, yeah, that's, that's his name, Anyway, old EE there had submitted a design for the new Thunderbird, and while it was not chosen for that nameplate, Ford liked it enough that they wanted it for a four-door version for the new Continental. Apparently in 61, slab sides were in. The Continental even rode on a stretched version of the Thunderbird's unibody frame. But before we dive into that, a quick word from our sponsors, and that is the Den of Tools merch store. We have the new uh, Red Beer Den of Tools approved line of stickers uh, in your choice of four fabulous colors. You can get white, brown, this kind of red magenta color, and of course, in Barracles Blue. But that's not all. You can get this uh, new logo on uh, some t-shirts. And also we got hoodies in several different colors available as well. Also one of the favorites, the Red Beard Mug. You can get your uh, get your pirate on there. And also you might find over there in, in the shop uh, this line, K&H. Just so you know, uh, the Misses and the Cubs decided they wanted to start selling some stuff on Etsy, some uh, handcrafted things that they make. And, uh, you know, in an effort to support them, uh, I whipped up that logo and we're uh, having some merch for them also. So that's why the uh, you'll see the K&H logo over there. So anyway, show your support for the Den of Tools. Show that you're a proud member and get your DOT approved merchandise today. In 66, they added a 462 cubic inch V8 to the Continental, making this the largest displacement engine ever put in a production car by Ford. Also in 66, they brought back the two-door coupe. Yeah. Sadly, in 67, though, that marked the last year of the convertible. In fact, this pretty much marked a long downhill slide for convertibles overall in the United States. Yeah, you can thank this lying idiot for that. Yeah, his book, Unsafe at Any Speed, not only killed the Corvair, but led to a general hysteria about rollover accidents in general. This also led to insurance companies using that as an excuse to start charging outrageous rates for ragtops overall. And that pretty much did in the entire convertible segment in the U.S. for several decades to come. 
That is, until Mazda made us take the red pill and woke us all up. Personally, I think the word of convertible here is a bit of a misnomer. I mean, if your car can't do this, it's not really a convertible in my book. You want wind in your hair? This is the only way you're going to get it that doesn't include freaking out every time you see some gravel in a corner. To be fair, though, there was another kind of big incident that maybe didn't help out the whole image of the convertible. And that was in 1963 in Dallas, Texas. While riding in his 61 Lincoln presidential state car, JFK was shot by a single shooter and hit by what must have been <laughs> the world's first smart bullet. After that, President's limos uh, went hardtop. Yep. Yeah. It kind of resembles a hearse. In 1970, Lincoln launched the fifth generation of the Continental. This car was sold as a coupe, a four-door, and a town car. Between 1970 and 79, they did a ton of minor revisions to the car. Most of these went into the town car variation, which was quickly becoming the best-selling package in the lineup. They raised the roof line, they added more legroom, there was a vinyl top added to the town car, opera windows in the C pillar, and a coach lamp was added to the B pillar. In 1980, the sixth gen of the Continental was released. The country had just gone through the gas crisis of the 70s and cafe standards were looming large. It was not a good time to be a large luxury car in the U.S. This version lost 14 inches overall and 10 inches to its wheelbase. In 82, they moved away from the, uh, the larger size body to the Fox body, now officially making this a mid-sized sedan. You could get the car with either a 129 horsepower 5 liter or a 140 horsepower 351 Windsor engine. To be fair, the car did manage to maintain the interior feel of a larger car, even though still being on a mid-size frame. The eighth generation of Continental was launched in 1988. In a cost-cutting measure, Ford was somehow able to remove every ounce of soul in the vehicle. Tell me. And remember, this is for posterity, so be honest. How do you feel? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Bonus points if you can name that movie. The Continental, now solidly in the mid-size market, uh, made it pretty much little more than an upscale Ford Taurus at this point. Uh, it had front-wheel drive, and it was the first Continental to not have the option for a V8. Instead, it shared the power plant with the Taurus and the Sable. Oh, the dark, dark times for the Continental. In 1995, the ninth and last generation of the Lincoln Continental was released. In a desperate effort to revitalize the brand, Lincoln did put an eight-cylinder back in the options list. This was done uh, pretty much to help that it could somehow compete with the uh, Cadillac's Northstar V8. But it was too little, too late. Too much had been given away. It lost too much of its brand recognition, becoming just another, you know, mid-sized sedan. And sadly, the Lincoln Continental nameplate was put to rest. But then, 15 years later, 2017 rolls around. The planets align. Light shines down from the heaven and the Lincoln Continental is born again. And yay, there was a great light seen in Detroit. And out from that light rolled the 10th generation Lincoln Continental, and it was good. Well, certainly not a return to the old ways, as this is also a front engine car built on the uh, standard platform, uh, midsize platform, uh, commonly used by Ford and Lincoln today. Uh, however, it is still at 117.9 inches, the longest uh, Lincoln Continental released in nearly 30 years. And while it's also true that there is no option for an eight-cylinder, technology has moved to the point where you can get a three-liter twin-turbo V6 in this that kicks out 400 ponies and 400 foot-pound of torque. To put that in perspective, that's pretty much exactly the specs that I have in my Ram with a Hemi V8. <laughs> that's a lot of power in a tiny package, let me tell you what. Well, as you can see behind me, the Lincoln Continental is back on the road again, and it's looking stylish. 
It's well appointed inside and out. It's got all the bells and whistles you'd want, front and rear seats included. Oh, and it's brought back that one thing we always wanted. Yep, for 2018, the 80th anniversary of the Lincoln Continental, they're releasing a limited production run, as I say, understand it, 80 to be exact, with coach doors. Don't call them suicide doors. <laughs> PR people get all feisty when you call them suicide doors. Oh, but look at that, man. That is, I'm sorry. Oh, that is a beautiful thing. And with that beautiful thing comes a beautiful price tag. Yeah, you're looking at over $100,000 for a Lincoln. Ouch! Oh, I mean, I like it. Don't get me wrong. It's a pretty, pretty thing, but I don't know if I'd be spending a hundred k on a on a Ford. Anyway, the Continental's back. It's styling, and you got to be happy to see it on the road. I guess someone forgot to tell it that the sedan was dead because it's alive and purring again. And I'm, I for one, am glad to see it. I, I was always been a big fan of the Lincoln. I know a lot of you know that the bear, I got a caddy and stuff. And, and I like my caddy, you know, even though I'm, I'm selling it. But I'm selling it due to space. If I, if I had the space, I'd keep it. But I'll tell you what, I'd trade it in a heartbeat for one of these sweet rides with the suicide doors. Oh, that, that's a beautiful thing. Anyway, that's all the bear has for you today. Hope you enjoyed your uh, brief history of the Lincoln Continental. Take care, everyone. As always, shine on. The only four-door made in the United States. Miles ahead of competition in every showdown. Roomier, more comfortable by far. Easier exit and entry. Sleek and clean-limbed as a panther. Top up or top down and flush with a deck.